Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'd like to start thanking the organizing committee as well as the MGIN group for this kind invitation. Today I'll talk on an important topic, which is the concept of biosimilars in IBD. In our country, we used to rely upon agriculture and we also we used to eat uh, homemade food. And for this reason, we had a very low prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease during the early 70s, 80s, and up to the early 90s. Unfortunately, during modernization and shifting to central Cairo, we started to adopt these bad habits of eating a lot of junk food, minimizing our activity, decreasing the exercise. So uh, this was the result of increasing prevalence of IBD disorders. Uh, it's well known from Ashwin that the urbanization and industrialization will result in emergence and flourishing of IBD among the society and the population in any country. The burden of IBD is gradually progressively increasing. We know this quite well. And by the year 2025, the prevalence of IBD will be much higher than that projected. This global rise of IBD will require a lot of efforts, not only from us as physicians, but for any healthcare provider who will need to innovate the delivery and the quality of patient's care, putting in consideration the economic and financial issues. The study from Zagazig by Professor Rehab have shown that the prevalence of IBD among the community of Egyptian reaches up to 11.2% with a predominance of ulcerative colitis over Crohn's disease. Another respectable study from Cairo University have shown that there is a gradual progressive increase in the prevalence of IBD from the year 95 to the year 2029. The reason for this is most probably, again, the modernization and civilization where the community is passing through. This is the situation, a growing number of patients over years and this necessitates the awareness of not only physicians, but also patients. And of course, we need to improve the diagnostic facilities to have very simple and easy way to screen and diagnose disorders of inflammatory bowel disease. Above all, we have to reconcile our management protocols. And again, considering financial issues is at utmost importance. We know our goals quite well. It's always to reach mucosal healing, keeping our patients steroid free and symptom free, and also avoid surgery, avoid cancer, and keep your patient in a very good quality of life. This is our well-known goal. This review article have shown that we are combating a disease which is really growing and progressing very slowly, but it reached a very uh, uh, a very big number of patients among our population. To combat this disease, this review articles recommend the use an effective therapy from the early beginning, which could be a biologic for, of course. But it's more important to consider the financial and economic issues, so they also recommend to find a way to decrease the treatment costs. Luckily enough, we have in the market a lot of uh, very powerful medications which are used and reach a, a remission in a good percent of patients. And even they maintain these patients in a remission for a long time. Most of these drugs are already available in the market. Some of them are in the final stages of being approved, but we have among the pipe, a big stream of medications which will be coming soon in the market. Either they are anti-TNF or anti-interleukin-3 or JAK inhibitors or sphingosine phosphate receptor modulators. The market has a lot of these and still you will get more and more of these expensive medicines. Of course, the most important disadvantage is the price we pay. So 
we know quite well that biologicals have shown a marvelous effect in maintaining the, in our patients with inflammatory disease in remission. But this costs a lot and it, and it throws a lot of burden on healthcare providers. Cost reduction will offer most of our patients a wider access. And of course, biosimilars appear here to have a proven efficacy and safety while they will be considered uh, much cheaper. What is a biosimilar? A biosimilar is a highly similar medicine which proves to be clinically similar in terms of safety and efficacy. Put in consideration that a biosimilar is not a biobetter, they are similar. It's not a biocopy and it's not a generic medication. They are so different, even when, they're, when they are approved, they are approved in a different way, not, not as the originator drug. When the originator drug gets approved, they start to demonstrate the safety, purity, and potency of the drug by clinical studies, some pharmacological studies and some non-clinical studies, and they have only few studies on the structure and functional assessment of the drug. But when the biosimilar gets approved, it starts in an upside down way, and they usually start where the originator has ended. They have the burden of anal analyzing the characteristics of the drug, the structure and the function. They have some clinical studies and pharmacological studies and very few clinical studies to prove the safety, efficacy and immunogenicity. But they mainly rely upon the totality of evidence that these medicines are uh, similar. They reach this scientific justification of similarity in the mechanism of action, in the pharmacokinetics, in the immunogenicity, and also they prove that they have a similar safety profile to the originator drug. Once they reach this, they take approval to be used in a certain group of patients, but a biosimilar has the advantage of having the ability to ex extrapolate the results to be used in several other indications which could be used without needing further studies. The biosimilar has a mechanism of action is quite similar to the originator drug. They oppose the soluble TNF and the transmembrane TNF, resulting in opposing the inflammatory pathways in all direction, resulting in a very similar anti-inflammatory mechanism of action. When the FDA started to give the recommendations how to study a biosimilar, they recommended using a sensitive population and use a sensitive endpoint. So what is a sensitive population? This should be a big group of patients, immunocompetent population, and you should include a group of patients with comorbidities, concomitant medications, and various de degrees or stages of severity. They also recommend a sensitive endpoint, which should be clinical objective point, and it should be continuous rather than binary. And of course, they recommend a lengthy time, which will allow you to adequately uh, measure the safety, the immunogenicity, the efficacy of the medicine. For these reasons, you can obviously see that patients with rheumatoid arthritis and patients with psoriasis are ideal patients to be included in the study of a biosimilar. A rheumatoid arthritis will give you the advantage of a big group of patients, while the psoriatic patients has the advantage of being immunocompetent. If you compare these groups of patients with IBD, you will realize that IBD patients are not a good group to be studied with a biosimilar because the high variability of the pharmacokinetics. And of course, if you are going to study a biosimilar in a group of inflammatory bowel disease, you need a surrogate marker, which is probably a drug monitoring. And this is a very expensive measure to be used. So if you want to test a biosimilar, it's not better than using group of patients with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis rather than using a patient with IBD. Data show the similarity of the originator, adilumab, 
and the biosimilar Adumab in reaching improvement in a group of patients with psoriasis, showing a PASI improvement at week 16, quite similar. And the good news is that this improvement is maintained over time in a very similar way to the originative drug up to the week 50. When you include a group of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, you find the same thing. Adilumab, whether originated or biosimilar, has the similar improvement in both groups of patients and in both arms at week 20, 24. And this was also uh, maintained for a long time and the similarity in results to the originator was proved. When you look to the safety, whether the serious adverse events or treatment induced adverse events, whether you are talking about opportunistic infections or malignancy, hypersensitivity, all of these show very, very similar results when you compare the originator with the biosimilar. Talking about pain at the site of injection is very important and appreciated by the patient. Being citrate free allows this medicine to cause no pain at the site of injection. And I would like to tell you that this was mostly appreciated by patients who receives this medication. Immunogenicity in the patients with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis shows that binding antibodies or neutralizing antibodies have very greatly similarities uh, between the uh, originator and the biosimilar. Relying upon the totality of evidence, it's true that the mechanism of action, the pharmacokinetics, the immunogenicity, the safety profile is similar between the originator and the biosimilar. And for this reason, the biosimilar adilumab was proved for use in a similar way and in all indications in which the originator adilumab has been uh, recommended to be used in. Adilumab received its FDA approval in September 2016 and one year later it received the European approval. Similarity in function is proved and it's well known as regard uh, binding to the soluble uh, anti-TNF or neutralizing the soluble TNF uh, as regards its inhibition of apoptosis, inhibition of cytotoxicity, chemokines. Uh, of course, this is all proved. And even other mechanisms or additional mechanisms of action are also plausible to be proved. When you compare the confidence of physicians in using biosimilars by years, you will find that this is growing very fast. This study shows that the year 2013, only 5% of physicians were confident to use a biosimilar, but by the year 2015, the number grow up to 30%. And if we do the study today, we can reach above 90% confidence in using a biosimilar. For this reason, you can find the ECHO position statement stating that they have quite great evidence and clinical trials telling them that the change in the perception of IBD expert is now ongoing. Now, the physicians are very confident in using a biosimilar and the confidence is gradually increasing. They also stated that biosimilar once approved by authority, they should be used, uh, they should be as efficacious as originator and they could be uh, exploratorated from another indication if you want to use them in another indications such as example IBD patients, it's acceptable also to switch from an originator to biosimilar. From the patient's perspective, extrapolation is seen with skepticism and interchangeability should be allowed only with transparency and awareness. Patients really want us to involve them in the decision making, which is very important to involve the patient, talk to them, explain everything so that they can accept the idea. And this will be of a great benefit, uh, especially that we would like to uh, uh, decrease the burden of economic uh, expenses. Well, my take home message would be that biosimilar maintain target and offer cost saving. They proved safe and effective. Some preparations have better tolerability, allow a wider scale of treatment options, Patients should be involved in our decision. By that, I would like to thank you all.
and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.